Hello everyone and welcome to this course on modern application development. Okay, so, so far we have been looking at the different ways by which we can implement the front end rendering or at least you know the generation of the HTML pages. Either you could do it server side rendered or you could have fully static or you could have some kind of a mix and you know do a certain amount of work on the client side. An important part of what makes that possible is this notion of asynchronous updates. Okay, so let's try and understand what that is. So the original web as designed in the late 80s, early 90s had this notion that, you know, it's just a client sends a request, the server responds and the client displays whatever came back from the server. Now, anytime you want to update what is displayed on the screen, a new request has to be sent from the client to the server. The server has to respond with the complete page, right, which is basically at that point was HTML. Even styling really didn't exist at that point. You pretty much had to give everything, you know, you just had the HTML tags, right? And it was in fact up to the browser how it would choose to display various things. The whole idea of different fonts and all didn't really, you know, exist at that time. So the client has to render the page again from scratch, okay? So it once again goes through, parses the entire HTML file and displays it. So what are potential issues over here? There is some amount of server load in the sense that lots of redundant data is being sent each time, right? There could have been like, for example, you know, it's quite likely that many pages might have the same header, footer, copyright information, navigation bars, and so on. And all of that now needs to be sent again from scratch each time. But, you know, that's not really server load, it's more of network load, right? Because after all, the server is just pretty much picking up static files and sending them. But on the other hand, when server rendering did come into the picture with CGI, right, it meant that the servers needed to do more work. They actually had to, you know, put everything together, assemble it and send it out, which effectively meant there was more work that needed to be done. And the end result, as far as the UX, the user experience is concerned, is that it also made pages slower to render because the whole page has to be redisplayed from scratch for every request. So then came the idea of an asynchronous update. At some point, people said, look, why not update only part of the page, right? Load extra data in the background after the main page has been loaded and rendered, okay? Which means that the first, the main page that you are going to see comes up pretty quickly because it's a small amount of data and you overall have a nice user experience, right? I mean, you click on a link, loads very fast, right? I mean, we generally feel happy when we are browsing and we come to a web page that loads fast and displays quickly, at least to start with, right? So let's say that, you know, you had a form where you were asked to select a kind of animal, right? Or a page where essentially it gave you a form that allowed you to select a kind of animal. Now you have two options. One is that each of those selections actually leads to a different link, which loads the complete HTML and displays it on the page, right? What would happen when you clicked on a link? It would basically, the whole page would go, you know, you, it would be very clear that you are going to a new web page because the entire screen would get refreshed, right? And it would start redisplaying the entire thing, including the navigation bars and everything else that you have from the beginning, okay? Now, instead, what could happen is, let's say that I click on the button to look for a cat, right? It requests data about that animal alone from the server, right? And in fact, that data could be in some kind of structured form, okay? So what is the structured form that we have over there? It might, for example, say, okay, what's the uh, common name of the cat? What's the Latin name of the cat? Uh, you know, where is it commonly found? Each of those could be a different structured piece of information that comes back from the server, okay? And all that you need to do is refresh one div. Of course, divs didn't exist at this point, but they came up later, but still just one part of the page and you know, put in the text corresponding to the animal. And even within that, you could have some part of it which basically shows the name of the cat, another one which shows the Latin name of the cat in a different font or you know in italics, uh, something else which sort of gives you information about where it's commonly found, right? So all of that could be structured easily and was sort of the precursor to the whole notion of APIs where you know you could have something where the server just returns the extra information needed in order to update the page. So this originally came up and was 
known for a long time as Ajax. I mean, the term Ajax sort of still exists, but is not so common these days. Essentially, what it stands for is asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Okay. And why XML? Because the XML took care of the structured data coming back from the server. Right? So this whole business of having structured information coming back from the server in the form of XML data, which can be easily parsed so that the Latin name, the uh, place where it is found and so on are easily distinguished, meant that the server now sends back data in that kind of format. It doesn't send a whole HTML page. It doesn't redo the styling. And as far as the client is concerned, it has most of the page already rendered. It just needs to replace one small part of it. Okay. So the core idea over here was that you could refresh a part of the document based on an asynchronous query, which happens in the background. So the asynchronous essentially means that it's happening in the background. It is not something which is in your critical path, right? It's not that you need to do that before you can start displaying the page. You display the main part of the page, perform this query and then update the page based on the response. Now, all of this required a new concept in terms of how the document that is being displayed on the screen needs to be thought of. And that's what's called the DOM or the document object model. Okay. The DOM can be thought of as essentially a programming interface for web documents. Okay. And the question that it's trying to answer is what exactly is a web page? Does it consist of just the HTML that you have sent? Or does it consist of what it looks like after it's been rendered on the screen? Or is there some kind of, you know, an abstract tree like model, which is sitting somewhere inside the memory of your process of your system, which is actually the web page, right? So this DOM is, in fact, an abstract model. It sort of takes the HTML and parses it out, right? breaks it up into a tree following the structure of the document. And now it says, OK, you know, since I have a tree structure, maybe I can use various kinds of algorithmic approaches or programming approaches in order to manipulate that tree. right? So I could have something which basically tells me that this is the overall structure of the tree and that these elements of the tree correspond to these parts of the screen. And if I modify one small portion of the tree in a certain way, I know exactly which parts of the screen need to get updated. Okay. And you know, they were able to bring in an object oriented approach to this, which allows manipulating the DOM, just like we are familiar with known uh, object oriented uh, techniques. Okay. For the most part, this is tightly coupled with JavaScript. Okay. And uh, that doesn't mean that the DOM by itself is fundamentally limited to JavaScript. It's just that most browsers support JavaScript for manipulating the DOM. They don't support other languages directly. But there is, for example, a Python class within XML, uh, within the XML module, which allows you to at least get the DOM information and then decide what you can do with it, you know, what kind of manipulation of the DOM is possible. So as an example, right, and you know, these websites that I sometimes link over here, uh, in particular, the Mozilla Developer Network, right, developer.mozilla.org is a very useful set of pages for anyone interested in developing for the web, right. It's of course done by the people who uh, create the Firefox uh, browser, which means that they are very knowledgeable about web technologies, right? And a lot of the information that's available over here also tells you about what kind of things browsers support, and they're also involved in the standardization process and so on. So an example that they give on the, their web pages, you could have for uh, something like this, where you basically in Java, this is after all JavaScript code, right? If you're not familiar with JavaScript, don't worry about it. It's a reasonably easy to pick up language, right? In some ways similar to C, in some ways similar to Python. It's sort of a mix of both, uh, but that's oversimplifying, right? Obviously, I mean, when you read it, when you start learning it, you understand what the differences are. But the point is, it's not too difficult to pick up, at least the basics. And all that I'm going to be looking at over here is something that could easily be understood even in terms of something like C, okay? And in this example, you know, we are basically taking the document object and there is a function which is part of the DOM manipulation uh, APIs inside JavaScript, 
which says query selector all right and basically we'll pick out all elements inside the dom that have the p type and what is p it's basically the paragraph type okay so therefore and it assigns that to an array called paragraphs so paragraphs of 0 will be the first p element paragraphs of 1 will be the second p element etc and alert paragraphs of 0 dot node name will basically pop up a small window showing the node name of the first par of yeah the first paragraph in this case okay so this is a very trivial example of what you know over here this document dot this is essentially what the dom is referring to right it's treating the document as an object and therefore i can do that object dot and some function name or a method name right which can be called on that object in order to get further information now i can get information what's more interesting is when i start manipulating the dom i can also put things onto the screen and this is an example of what could be done right so all of this this initial part the html and the closing part are just required boilerplate around it what is interesting is that when the window is loaded you can tell it to run this particular function okay now this syntax is something that's called an anonymous function in javascript right what it says is i'm just going to create it as a function and put it within these curly braces without giving it a name so the function doesn't have a name i'm just declaring it as a function and assigning it directly to this window dot on load right so all that it means is when the window is loaded all of these steps will get executed what will actually happen it will go to the document it will create a new element of type h1 so an h1 heading right it will create another text node with the value big head and it will take whatever he heading this uh, page already had or rather right somewhere out here whatever it had right and oh, okay sorry uh, it will take this heading object and append heading text to that heading object and it will take the body out here and append whatever it has just created inside the body which means that after this has run this will basically start end up looking like body slash body but inside it will actually have h1 slash h1 and this big head will be there as the text inside the h1 tag okay so it has basically taken the html that you had out here which didn't have anything in the body and added something to it okay that's manipulating the dom okay and that's where essentially the power of ajax or you know any kind of uh, dom manipulation or uh, than javascript does comes from the fact that it can do that means that it can update pages dynamically now what that means is that you know once you can manipulate the dom through programs you can bring a lot of different concepts from programming into the manipulation you can think of objects you can compose objects you can combine them together in different ways you can have loops iterators all of this at runtime in the client's browser okay now that gives you tremendous fl flexibility in terms of what the front end is capable of doing right on the other hand it also adds a lot more complexity into what the front end is doing into what the front end is capable of and there is quite a good possibility that you complicate things too much and you know make the whatever you are trying to develop quite hard to understand right so you always have to be careful of that right i mean like the saying goes with great power comes great responsibility you need to be careful of how you use something like this so to summarize asynchronous updates basically opened up front end development in a big way right they brought in a whole new ways of improving the user experience and nowadays there are a whole lot of different frameworks and technologies that are built around this it's no longer sort of goes by the name ajax as such but on the other hand the core ideas developed from there the fact that you could asynchronously get data and update whatever it is that's coming on the screen is what is being put to use okay most of it unfortunately is beyond the scope of this course it is essential knowledge for someone uh, involved in app development right so it's something that i will leave here except that we'll be looking at a little bit more about what is you know what can be done and what are the implications on browsers and so on 
but not really going into details on how to use this.